Today's guest is a superstar athlete, widely regarded as one of the best ever to play the physically demanding, intellectually challenging game of tennis, John McEnroe. During his years touring the globe on the pro circuit, John developed a passion for art. So today we're in Manhattan on Green Street in Soho where he owns an art gallery here in the middle of one of the world's most important art districts and in an area teeming with outstanding restaurants, including the Rialto, a favorite of John's, and they're going to be preparing our food today. So join me for a private lunch at the John McEnroe Gallery with the intensely competitive, frankly outspoken, very funny father of five, John McEnroe, one of the greatest ever to pick up a tennis racket. I wonder how he is with a fork. At a corner table in John's gallery, we hoisted our forks to a grilled wild mushroom sausage and tomato and fennel salad. John, thank you very much for letting us have the corner table here in your gallery. <laughs> yeah. Forks up. All right, thank let's you. do it. Uh, by the way, it's a beautiful gallery, and you know, if there's a crash in the market, you could have a restaurant here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want any crashes anymore. No, I don't in the know about a restaurant. That's a tough business. That's even tougher than art. You, you know, people are not. Most people are not, even though there's a big article in Sports Illustrated, not accustomed to thinking of John McEnroe in the art context. But you were 21 years old, and you wrote out a $300,000 check for a Renoir. Did I? Yeah, you did. <laughs> I don't have the canceled check. What, wait, what did that feel like? I mean, a couple of years before that, you were probably getting spending money from Well, your there parents. was a buildup. You know, I didn't have money uh, even a, just a couple of years before that, and suddenly I came upon some money. So who better than to asked my buddy Vita Scarolitis, God oh, rest his soul, indeed. about how to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> so he took me right to Soho and started, he, he figured it was pretty much hopeless for me with clothes at, at that age. So You're doing okay now. I'm improving, you know, yeah. I'm improved with age, but uh, then it was jeans, t-shirt, would do it. And, and then the idea of having a place to live or a car or something to hang in your house is what it boils down to, because to me, I'm not a big, look at the stocks type guy. So collecting was, that wasn't my first purchase. That was a little, probably a little bit later than 21. And but I was just thinking, though, at that early age to write out a check for $300,000. I mean, a lot of big athletes who, you know, hit a millionaire in early status are buying like a Ferrari, but you were buying artwork early on. I wasn't a big car guy, and I felt like uh, something that I really enjoyed, but that conceivably, I hate to use the word even that you're using yeah. as an investment, but the idea of trying to be, at least I wouldn't lose money. And it just so happened on that piece that that piece actually did quite well when I resold it because the Japanese became huge Impressionist fans. Right. But um, the, the art world satisfies, a, 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 I, I understand, a, a part of your brain, like music does the same thing, that's the non-competitive right. side. Where, if at all, does food fit in? Are you? <laughs> If at all. I'm well, we talked off camera, and I think both of us are a bit hypoglycemic, so yeah. if I don't have my food every couple hours, I pretty much freak out. Yeah, which me is, too. Which is, you know, explains why I got upset on the court all those years. Dude, we're just I just hungry. was hungry. That's yeah, all. that makes sense. What sort of shape are you in now? Physical well, shape. Well, uh, <laughs> I'd rather not take a close-up of my stomach, but first to tennis, uh, Connie Hawkins said it best, the older I get, the better I used to be. So yeah. the tennis is going downhill. <laughs> And I find it tougher to keep in tip-top shape because I need someone to knock on my door and say nine o'clock, whatever, take the kids to school. And unless I have someone pushing me saying, hey, look, you gotta work, I'm charging X amount, I'll just get a little lazy and not do it so much. So I've tried to be in reasonable shape, but uh, the reasonable shape has not put me enough over the top to say, dominate even the seniors tour. Were you ever <laughs> in bad shape in your life? I mean, like, no. ever wake up in the morning and say, what, 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 what's going on here? You've always uh, been in reasonably I good. I would say so, yeah. yeah. I, I, as a kid, I played sports constantly. It didn't matter what sport it was, so I was always running around. So uh, I had a bit of a baby fat, because I didn't realize that you went to college that dessert was an option. <laughs> so my mom always made me such great desserts, <laughs> cakes and brownies. What, what did she make? What, what, if, if your mother could put one on the table right now. Chicken what, casserole. No, I meant dessert. Oh, dessert. Uh, she used to make this great chocolate cake with vanilla icing or reversal vanilla cake with chocolate icing. Uh, apple pie was fantastic at the holidays. But there was always something. I mean, every meal there was dessert. Did you, as, as a professional athlete, John, did you have to deny yourself a great deal in terms of food, drink, 
lifestyle patterns. I mean, when you're number one in the world, as you were for four years, right, and number two, a couple years before that, right, what don't you do to stay up there? You, you have to uh, cut, uh, cut around the corners a little bit of everything. You know, you may want another beer at night after yeah. you want to let down, you don't do that. You may want to eat something. When you get hungry, you try not to do that. You get away from eating the desserts on any sort of regular basis. Make it sort of more reward. Maybe one day a week at the end of the tournament, you'd let go and go out and really have a couple of drinks, try yeah. to loosen up. But basically, you have to uh, tell yourself it may be that one day a week, and the rest of the time would just be like waiting for the moment, the four or five times of the singles and the you know, three or four times of the doubles where you go on that court and try to have all your energy available to you at that time. Everything that you need. And what's it feel like at that peak moment for John to walk onto the tennis court and have the crowd go wild? It's like the gladiator feeling, except you don't, at least you're not, your, your life's not on the line. I mean, the difference between, you know, tennis and boxing is compared. Very to similar. me, to me, this is, uh, there's obviously similarities, but the great difference is, is that we're hitting a ball and that there's no physical contact between the players, which in players probably wish it was with me and I wish <laughs> it was with them. So uh, we don't have that release. And in boxing, you're literally uh, risking your life, potentially. You go out there and, and, and it's such a... Another thing I've often wondered, when we see the shots in a really intense competitive match, particularly some of your great matches, where you were letting out unbelievable amounts of emotion on the court. Now, you're sitting there, the umpire's in the middle. Did you ever feel like, you know, smashing the other guy, just so physically upset that you felt like accosting your opponent? Yeah, yes. I had quite a few times, actually. And as I said, there was probably a couple occasions where they when wanted they, to when return they, the when they felt that way. There were some exhibitions where we threatened each other. And, who? You know, it'd be like, well, say me and Jimmy. I said, I know I can beat that guy. That guy's literal than me. You know, I don't care what happens. Right. After this match, I'm going to kick his ass. You yeah, know, that much And emotion. I was convinced of it. I was going to do it, absolutely dead set. <laughs> and then after the match, you know, you sort of have to maybe answer a question or two uh, if, there's a, if it's on TV or you got to go to press. You sort of cool down a yeah. little bit. You have a few friends there. Next thing you know, you're out of the hell with it. It's not worth it getting suspended for X amount of time. And I, I sort of miss that a little bit. I think that it'd be nice some way if, uh, well, if the option was available, you could step into a ring. After well, you have, been, you have been talking about ways to improve the game of tennis. I mean, throw a little the hockey. Controversial the controversial Mike Tyson explained that Mike. he Mike snapped in the ring when he bit Evander Holyfield's ear. There it is. Could you identify with that explanation? I don't know if I could quite go to that level. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> First, you have to jump over the net, yeah. race up, you know. That'd be a hell of a thing. Leap on board's ear. Like a bite his ear, you know. That is a, that's a snapping. See, that's the difference, what I said, between boxers and tennis. Yeah. Us snapping is yelling at the umpire, for God's sake. Right. When they snap, they bite their opponent's ear off. <laughs> John can still be seen playing opponents in his prime on Center Court Classics right, on God, Classic Sports on. Network, where his same temper is also you evident. You cannot be serious. That ball was on the line. Shaw flew up. It was clearly in. How can you possibly call that out? How many are you going to miss? Now he's walking over. Everyone knows it's in, in this whole stadium. And you call it out? Explain that to me, will you? And these days, he offers insightful comments as a tennis analyst. So I figured our lunch was a good opportunity for a follow-up question. You said at the U.S. Open, even the great ones get tense here. I think you were talking about Sampras, and I, I was, not, not, excuse me, not the U.S. Open, Wimbledon. Oh, I'd take your pick, either yeah. one. Well, you said even the great ones get tense. So for the benefit of everybody watching who may not be a tennis player, but maybe they had to give a speech, maybe they're having a dinner party, maybe they're going in to talk to the boss for a promotion, and they're tensing up, how does a professional athlete, world class, control that. Well, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first set to Mr. McEnroe. Let's take a time out in the gallery's kitchen to see how that grilled wild mushroom sausage is prepared. The dish is a creation of the Rialto's executive chef, Scott Schwartz. Um, what we do to order is we grill the sausage. Uh, the sausage is made up of shiitake mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, um, portobello mushrooms, and any other wild mushrooms that happen to be available at the time we're making it. And we clean them, slice them, saute them, uh, finish them with some shallots, some fresh herbs. And then once they're cool, we mix them with a the chicken mousseline, which is a mixture of uh, chicken breast meat, cream, and eggs. And then that binds the mushrooms together. We use just enough mousse to hold the mushrooms together. And as I slice it, you'll be able to see that uh, it's 
the dish is mostly mushrooms. It's not mostly mousse. Um, we take the sausages are then wrapped in plastic, I, as opposed to using a casing of any sort. And we use plastic wrap, and then we poach them. Uh, once they're poached, we chill them, and then we can hold them till we're ready to use them. The shallot vinaigrette is it's, it's fresh shallots that we roast in extra virgin olive oil. And then once they're cooled, we slice them up and mix them with uh, Spanish wine vinegar, sherry vinegar, uh, salt, coarse black pepper, and we use the olive oil that's been infused with the shallot flavor to make the vinaigrette. Tennis great John McEnroe at his art gallery in Soho comes from the menu of the Rialto restaurant at 265 Elizabeth Street on a picturesque block of Little Italy. It's owned by close friends of John, Sammy Martinez and Sean Meenan. And it's hard to believe that this beautiful restaurant started out as a rundown garage three months before opening day. And now, lunch. And I've got the portobello mushroom Napoleon, which looks good. And you, John? Good old fashioned American turkey burger. Turkey burger. The other, uh, the other evening on the Nuveen tour, I w was interviewing your longtime rival, Bjorn Borg, about you. And he said it's some lovely things. You know, even today we're good friends, and you know, and it's it's always nice to be around John, though, and you know, to see him as as, as happy as right now for the moment is is very nice to see. What makes this such a happy time of John McEnroe's life? Well, I have a wonderful wife who's just recently married, Patty Smythe, who is also a great singer in her in her own right. Great mother as well. We have a little baby, 19 months. We also have uh, well, we together now as have. Uh, a big family of five, three of mine from my ex-wife and one of hers from her ex-wife. So we have a group of five at our house now. So it um, keeps us busy, to put it mildly. What, what's, the, the, what's your dinner table like at home with yourself, Patty, and when everyone's there, all five Here's children? my dinner table uh, routine, OK? Put your napkin on your lap, please. Yes, sir. Say, say thank you once in a while and when you get your food. Possibly bring your plate into the sink. Is that possible? <laughs> a little bit of a little. Every day we do the same thing, and sooner or later it's going to stick. So far it hasn't worked too well. Because they're all basically young children. I mean, Kevin is your oldest. 11, 11, 9, 6, and 1. Borg himself, once a fierce rival, is now a member of John's extended family. But they still compete on the Nuveen Seniors Tour. He doesn't hit the ball as hard, Bjorn. He doesn't look quite the same. He got the gray, but I'll tell you, he runs. He and covers runs the court for sure. And it's just for the seniors tour. You're like, first I play Eddie Dibbs, was the old bagel twin. Then I'm Mel Purcell, who still runs around. Then I'm Bjorn, the top everything. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> I got to work out harder. That's for sure. Well, it never hurts to work out harder. The older you get, actually, the more Absolutely. you need to work out. But life seems to just dump. to stay the same. Just to you know, stay which is sort of insane. Not you know, to fall I back. Work harder, get trained, and then you're like, yeah. I put on two pounds. How did that happen? A perfect invitation for dessert, which helps John answer a question. The, the summer cover of a tennis magazine had what's wrong with Andre Agassi on the cover. How do you, how do you answer that question? Is there anything wrong with him? Or is... Too many of these. <laughs> John mastered tennis and is now looking to gain creative release and credibility as a rock musician. He plays guitar and sings in a straight ahead Lou Reed style. Uh, how far do you want to take music? As far as they'll let me take it. <laughs> <laughs> Which probably won't be all that far, but I find uh, it just like you mentioned earlier in the interview, use the other side of, uh, other side of your brain, the, the less competitive side, the one that says you don't have to be the best at absolutely everything, but you can actually maybe do something because you enjoy it and it's not about the money and it's about something that's pleasurable. And there's also something about art and music. It's, just, it's using the, the half of your brain that's not, you know, like this. Keep me calm. And John has a few friends in the business who could be helpful. It's like nothing I'm else. I'm looking to get on a stadium <laughs> tour. I'm trying to have my friends from the Stones or you two throw me a bone, you know, and say, hey, John, you need us to open up for you? So you're that serious about the music? I'm almost that serious to ask. You know, I'm a, I have, so far, I've been afraid to ask, although 
the littler ones, I am trying to look at some point to get on with some people. That way, it's not like everyone's coming to see you How play. How about Bowie, David Bowie? I can see the oh, two absolutely. of you. absolutely. Weren't you once playing your guitar in a <laughs> hotel room and Bowie was upstairs and you didn't know it and he came down to your room? We were staying in the same hotel and I happened to be working on Suffragette City, which is one of his great songs, right. early on in my guitar career. So you can imagine it was pretty weak. And I get a knock on the door and I'm, who the hell is this? I'm trying to learn this song. David Bowie. You know, and he's like, look, John, come on up. Come up for a drink. We've got to promise not to play that tune anymore, okay? <laughs> well, you, know, you were just learning. I'm driving the guy point. nuts. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I don't think he'd appreciate a whole lot more now. What was the dinner table like in the McEnroe household when you were 12 years old? T a typical night at dinner at home, 12 years well, old. Well, you know, my mom was uh, a great cook, or at least so I thought at that time. And uh, she'd so give us the old chicken casserole, which was one of my personal favorites. Get the noodles, the vegetables, the chicken. How about the vibe around the table? Conversation? Well, if you saw me around, you'd probably guess that my parents weren't exactly quiet either. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they love each other. They're still together after almost 39 years. Uh, but there was uh, the old Irish Catholic tempers uh, going around a little bit. So we had our share of, uh, let's say, us raising our voices a little. But that was normal. See, that's why for me, when I go on to court and start sort of questioning calls, people yell. It's like, what's the big deal? This is normal. Or living in New York? I mean, how many times do you get called a jerk a day in the car, for God's <laughs> sakes, you know? What's at home in your apartment, in your large apartment here in New York? What's in the refrigerator right now? If you right open now, a door, what do you see in there? A couple beers and a couple soft drinks and some, uh, a lot of lettuce, fruits, vegetables. I always try to start my kids off with fruits before they eat anything else. Really? Got to have some fruit. And... Uh, then you hit the stuff that maybe is not quite as healthy, the cereals, the waffles, maybe some eggs, sometimes pancakes. Wow. And then I have enough around whether it's, you know, an entire meal we need to cook. But there's loads of stuff. There's a little treats, a dessert, uh, popsicles, ice cream, things of that nature. So it's a full, full refrigerator. All right, how about this? Suppose, theoretically, I could beam you up and beam you down anywhere in the world. Where would you like to be having dinner tonight? And with whom would you like to be having it? Oh, man. You got I, you it. Know, Star I, Trek style, up I, and down. I think I'd like to try uh, to bring my wife, uh, Patty, with me. And I think I'd like to go to a place like Prague, you know, a place, a place that I really have. I've only been there like one or two days. Supposedly, it's the Paris of the Eastern Europe. It was, from what little I saw, absolutely beautiful. Prices are just, you have a whole meal for like $10. Wine's $5 a mm -hmm. bottle. And the food's supposed to be really good. So it, it's not something, you know, obviously I've done the Paris's, you know, no. those lame romantic places. <laughs> They're but not probably, that lame. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know. The most beautiful of all, if I was going to go to a place I have been to, would be take uh, Patty to Venice. Let's go 10 years into the future. We come back to the gallery, sit at this table. What do you want to say about life 10 years hence? That I was a good father that uh, I brought something positive to the sport of tennis even now in the last 10 years, whether it's the commentary, part of the seniors tour, if and when I ever get involved with the Davis Cup Olympic situation, playing with younger players, that I can add a positive, that I can find some sort of true niche in the art world, that I can bring my ideas to show as much art as possible, not to keep it in warehouses and have some artificially placed prices that that it, it's about politics. You know, I'm not in this for the money. I'm in this to not lose money. The rest of the time, I'd like to show young artists, possibly. And the music thing is, is my own personal favorite. That's where I derive the most sense of enjoyment. And if I can get out there and just be, quote, unquote, a musician on some respectable level, that would be my goal there. Well, you know, one of the things that's difficult is, I think, it's so much of narrow thinking. People sometimes don't want to give you two things. They want to say, he's a great tennis person, but he could never, right. you know, Absolutely. I think that in, in an, an interesting way, John Tesh totally <laughs> transcended that. By, That's frightening. <laughs> but he did. But he did. Be, 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 be going from being a television personality to somebody who has an actual music audience. I mean, it's not rock. He went from the entertainment it's side to the elevator. The elevator music. <laughs> it's, it's, it's red And rocks. he sold millions. He sure has. Well, listen, I'd like to close the show by asking you to offer a toast to, uh, with your coffee cup, I guess to our uh, Television Food Network viewers. What would you like to say to them? Eat healthy, eat well, and indulge once in a while. I'll drink to that. Thank you very much. Thanks, John McEnroe here at...